Welcome to the Hospitality Maverick podcast with me, Michael Tinkser. We at Hospitality Mavericks are here to inspire leaders to create heart-centered and profitable businesses from the inside out, the kind to both employees and customers love and support. Thanks to Biz Simply for sponsoring this episode as our show partner. And Biz Simply is the all-in-one HR, workforce management, road and operations software designed and built by hospitality experts to make every shift run like clockwork. And we join forces to help the industry to find new ways to become even more innovative in how we lead our people, how we operate, to how we grow our businesses, to how we serve our customers. Together, we want to share strategies and tools that can make the industry thrive long-term, not just survive. What is our real goal of our leadership development? I want them to be grounded on where's the ROI, where's the return on investment and return on time. Because for my clients, what I encourage them to do, if they're not going to invest in leadership development for 18 months, I encourage them not to do it. But most people want to, need to. And what I want to do is, how do we get it as a belief? Whatever, how do we fit it into your values in whatever way makes it right for you? It's not cookie cutter. The question I ask, I'd ask anybody listening to this right now, if you're considering development, what's the benefit if you do? If you tweaked or changed and took a different approach to people development, and what's the risk if you don't? And that's kind of the grounding exercise. And if you can get grounded there, then you can choose what's best for you and your team. This is Matt Roll, a hospitality and leadership coach and author. He is helping hospitality leaders and their teams to achieve the results they want and deserve. And as always, conversations with Matt is like fireworks of energy, and this was no different. We will today take a deep dive into what great hospitality leaders know and do, and what Matt learned about leadership by writing his latest book, You Can't Do It Alone. Why clarity is the rocket fuel for you and your team, the importance of building a unique people experience, the new era of hospitality leadership, the future of hospitality, and some great practical leadership hacks for you to implement straight away. Before you tune in, please sign up for a weekly newsletter packed with more Maverick insights, strategies, and tools. Find the link in the show notes or visit hospitalitymavericks.com. Grab your notebook and tune in. So today we're going to be talking about something uh, I actually got a bit, you know, after reading Matt's book, uh, You Can't Do It Alone, got a very much aware about again. And actually, I think I preached it, but not in that way. And as the clarity is power and he has it from uh, he's inspired by Tony Robbins as myself. And I think we often forget that in, in leadership and in, 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 in running business, that like spending enough time on clarity and actually it's like a muscle that needs to be trained. You can't go on a workshop or a retreat and then just have your three-year plan in place. You actually need to work on clarity as a leader all the time. And then there's many elements under that and how you build great culture and how you get people to join us. And, and Matt and I have been talking a couple of times and, and also been fortunate enough to get a copy of his book, here and I've been reading it and uh, yeah I think that's what we're going to dive through today but with that said welcome to the show Matt I'm really looking forward to to dive into all this and uh, see what we can do to 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 help people out there become better I'm really excited for the conversation especially if we've had a chance to connect a few times now and yeah what, what really matters now right? we're reopening we're we're rebuilding and right now it's about our people, right? How do we get our people focused in the direction of our goals in a way that matters? And I'm, I'm excited to jump into this conversation today. Yeah, because there's no doubt about many probably have a, a specific outcome right now. How do I get more of the right people and enough of them um, as the CEO challenge right now? But just to set the stage a bit, Matt, uh, can you talk a bit about, you know, your journey, the milestones, um, the purpose of what you're doing now and, and the clients you're working with and and uh, what really is your passion? Yeah, and I'll, I'll just do the, the brief bio, but um, where it really starts for me is I grew up um, diagnosed with a learning disability and I was put into here in Canada what they call learning strategies classes. Um, so struggled really through the school system, uh, learned to communicate because I wasn't really able to, to learn at the level that was expected. But when I got to high school, I remember a guidance counselor saying to me, Matt, you want to look for alternative employment. You should you want to go probably look in, for trade jobs here in, in Canada. 
And I really took that to heart. But where I found myself was in hospitality, you know, in, in an industry where people didn't judge me based on the way others might on my resume or, or what I could share and fell in love with the hospitality industry uh, through college and university and after worked for Bacardi, which a lot of us know, and then worked for Anheuser-Busch. And in those, in those roles, I got exposure to hundreds of restaurant operators and, and really fell in love with the business. But what I couldn't understand was that people that were in the top 10 in my territory or my region were selling all kinds of my beer. But when I met with them in their office, and especially back then, they usually had a cigarette in one hand and a glass of scotch or a beer in the other, um, they were complaining they weren't profitable. So as a 20-something year old, I, I left the beer industry. It was pretty fun. You got all the tickets and all the beer and all the fun. But what I really wanted to help do was support these operators you know, to get what they wanted from their restaurants because I, I fell in love with the, the industry. And we started a company that's now called Results Hospitality that went into restaurants and found a way to put $100,000 to the bottom line in the first 12 months. We did it through third-party inventory and service evaluations. Um, and over about five years with that company, I realized I wasn't coaching inventory. Um, I didn't really, don't really have a passion for inventory. Um, what I was coaching is behavior change through restaurant leaders. And we split the two companies. Results Hospitality still deals with a couple hundred operators, some of the biggest hotel brands globally, the biggest restaurant operators here in Ontario, Canada. Um, and we're helping make them have more and safe profitability in their operation. Uh, but for the last seven, eight years now, where I've spent most of my time is in rooms with leaders and leadership teams, focusing on the people element of the restaurant. So how do we get our people, the right team in place? How do we get us focused and clear on where we're going? But how do we support their development and, and ultimately for us, the retention and attraction of new people? So my passion and what I do all day, every day, and I'm very, very grateful for what I do. It's been a remarkable week this week. But I get a chance to work with the leaders and leadership teams because um, I saw what happened when they're not invested in. They leave. They're upset. And sometimes they're taken advantage of working 80-hour work weeks with no path or no growth. Um, so I deeply care about owners to get what they want and deserve. But I also care about that new supervisor, the new host, the GM who could be the next CEO of their own restaurant brand. Um, I spend all day, every day working with leaders. And, and that's my passion. And, and that's, my, that's my work. That's my, my, my dream. <laughs> So, so Matt, I have always had this feel that in general in hospitality, we have not invested enough in our leadership capabilities uh, in organization. It's always been, you know, either because we wanted to promote people or whatever it was, but we always had that capability gap on leadership skills. Some organizations are, of course, great at it, but in, in a general sense, I just feel that was even pre-pandemic and also think post-pandemic. We're not actually investing in not in leadership training. And that's in principle what you do. You make leaders better. Well, what is your view on in general, you know, adaption of great uh, leadership training and investing in leaderships in, in the organization? Yeah, it's a great question because I think there's a, a big gap. So I get a chance to get exposure to a lot of different businesses. You know, my, my home and the home that I've chose for the clients that I support at our core is multi-site restaurant groups that are growing and scaling. But what I find is that when we get to ownership or senior leadership or say C-level positions, that they've had the opportunity to be on a career track where they've got exposure and they get continuous development and they have coaches come in and they get to go to conferences. So the top end continues to get developed and very supported in their development. But what I find where the gap is, is as we get to the venue execution level, might have a bit of investment or entertainment delivered to our GMs and our chefs and our regional managers. But one thing I'm really passionate about the gap is I talk about the core of restaurants. Who are the managers in your configuration, quick service, hotel, or restaurant that are spending all day, every day interfacing face-to-face -face with your guests and with your staff? And I think that's the gap. And for any scaling restaurant group, if we're not investing in that core, as we grow, we have to hire from outside. And that puts culture at risk and time at risk. So I, I think the big opportunity now and the, and the choices, do you believe in putting the dollars aside and not only the dollars, but the time to invest in your leadership today for retention and development purposes? Um, the Gallup organization does the largest employment study every year. They do 8 million people across eight business sectors. And the number one thing that comes year after year that people want after their base financial needs are met 
is to grow and develop in their roles. So, you're, you're, and this is pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, people demand this. If they don't feel supported and clear, they're going to leave. It doesn't mean you have to do it. It's not right or wrong. It's a choice. Um, I know my position, I know yours, but right now is, do you believe in investing in your people to retain them? Because retention over attraction, and then it could, what will allow you to attract people to create a competitive point of difference. But if you're scaling in a restaurant group, what I hate to see is when a GM leaves and we unplug a GM and then all of a sudden the business plan falls. It's because we didn't have the GMs are going to leave your restaurant group this year. They just are. If you have multi-sites, who's the future leader that's going to step in? What's the bench and how do we support their development? So interesting what you're saying there as well is that, you know, you almost wait to the gap comes in the organization. Then you think now we're going to invest and that's actually too late because in principle you should have done it prior to that. And you put that, maybe there's a person that steps up, but they are not ready. They're not ready for the challenge. You're never ready, but you don't have any tools to actually go on your journey. You're just put in that job and giving the responsibility. Suddenly you're responsible for 100 people, 60 people, 40 people, where before you were in second command, which is a very different job. Yeah, it is. And I think the one thing that you're saying there is, is, pers- is leadership development, is it a belief or is it a to-do? Because we see things on social media or we talk to our peers or we go to a conference so we do an event. And I applaud any time that you could put towards your people, but there's a fundamental difference when I get exposure to groups and we really do this filtering before working with a client is what is our real goal of our leadership development? I want them to be grounded on where's the ROI, where's the return on investment and return on time? Because I want you to see it because for my clients, what I encourage them to do, if they're not going to invest in leadership development for 18 months, I encourage them not not to do it. Don't start because it can actually create turnover. Uh, but most people want to need to. And it, what I want to do is how do we get it as a belief? Whatever, How do we fit it into your values in whatever way makes it right for you? You know, development for it's not cookie cutter. Um, but right now we know, right? We're the, we have the great resignation globally. We have 200% annual staff turnover in most hospitality operators. Uh, quick service is approaching 400% annual staff turnover. The question I ask, I'd ask anybody listening to this right now, if you're considering development, what's the benefit if you do? If you, if you tweaked or changed and, and took a different approach to people development and what's the risk if you don't, and that's kind of the grounding exercise. And if you can get grounded there, then you can choose what's best for you and your team. Yeah. And I love you say it's a choice because it's a choice about what kind of future your business have as well. So, so as you work with, you know, leaders over the years, uh, Matt, and, and especially, you know, it's really interesting what, what you've done here you know we call it pre-pandemic or post-pandemic sorry uh what what have you learned about what great hospitality leaders know and do um and that's really you know the book it was you know with my with my school career i never thought i'd write a book i think you've read some of my emails and they're not the clearest and there's probably some grammar and spelling mistake in those but what i I get a chance to work with all these leaders and there there was this pattern that really stood out and what i noticed from top performing leaders that operated more frequently at what i call flow so they had the biggest businesses with the largest teams, but they were the most comfortable, the most in control of their calendar. And what I found was, as I, I broke down and learned from leadership, is leaders that are investing in their teams or making their team go through development have a belief themselves. You know, we I can see all the books behind you, and we talked about Tony Robbins, and we're talking about Phil Jackson and these people. It's, it's a belief, but what I learned from the top performing leaders having a chance to work, have exposure to a few hundred of them, is there's a belief and in investment in self. And somebody said a quote to me last year during the pandemic, and it hit me is, we can't take care of others until we take care of self. Um, so there's a relentless passion for development for themselves. And that carries on culturally to their team. You know, one of the red flags is if I see a leader say, I want to do development for my people, but I don't have time for it for myself or my team. That, that's, a, that's a concern for me where I'll spend, it, it can happen, but I want to spend some time there. Um, but I found leaders are investing in themselves. Um, they're starting to create boundaries. You know, it's more of a therapist word. My therapist uses it a lot. So boundaries of what's what's work and what's life. And I'm not a, somebody who really believes in balance, but how do we have supporting time for both? And I know this is a bit of a deeper, we're, we're getting into the real stuff here, but how, how, do we, how do we show up right to work? How do we invest in ourselves so we can support our people? And I think if people, the leaders that I've seen that have that focus, it's never perfect. It's a journey are, are achieving the best results. And it's so interesting you say, because a lot of leaders in what I've seen in my perspective, they want to jump in and fix the business or the people within the business, but actually often the business is 
a reflection of themselves or shadow and they actually need to look in the mirror instead of out of the window before they because out of the window it's not going to create the change you want you need to be the change you want to see like gandhi said um and i think it's so interesting that taking that time and i think um and actually stepping back and actually finding out what do i need to change to get that outcome in my business and that's a question i'm asking a lot in this story like i've got a a grounding story for me as probably 28 years, 28 years old, 30 years old, started my couple companies, was seeing really good results, but I did a shark tank like presentation to a hundred entrepreneurs more on getting a mentor for strategy and do this really nervous. You know, these people are my mentors. They're running these huge multi-million dollar businesses and I get done and my face is red and I'm excited and the feedback's great. And then the feature coach that came in or shark, if we want to say that it was Warren Rustin, he played in the NBA. He worked for George W. Bush. He's a multi-billionaire through oil. And he looked at me and he said, Hey Matt, one of my challenges, he said, do you feel you're the bottleneck in your business right now? And I'm standing for these people. I'm like, what do you mean? Like everybody just said that was great. He's like, no, do you feel that maybe your energy and your lack of focus is what's getting in the way for, for your business? And he pulled me aside afterwards. It was very good coaching. I was a bit embarrassed and, and off at, at, in the moment because um, I was young and emotional, but he pulled me aside and he said, you've got the right things, but you, you really need to look at your role inside the business. And the one question that I ask leaders a lot this year, because they're con we're constantly talking about others. And what I say is I can't coach the person who's not in front of me. I can't talk about Sally who's not here. I'm meeting with Michael. So what, do, what does Michael need to change himself in order to get the results that he wants and deserves? But I think it's that grounding, again, that question. And, and in my business, I, this last two years were the hardest of my career. I had a lot I needed to change with self. There's no direction here. Like I've done a lot of work. I've done more therapy. I've done more coaching programs. I've spent more time with myself uh, to make sure I'm the leader I need to be. But the question for leaders out there is what do you need to change first as the leader before your people adapt and change? Yeah. And it's so interesting. Uh, as you say there, there's a lot you have to change. So that what is the, like your, your top learning in, 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 you know, being in this transition in principle? For me, I felt my want during the, one of my weaknesses as a leader is how I grew up in a traumatic environment. I don't want to see anybody fail or make mistakes or, or get hurt. And during the pandemic, I felt as many leaders that I've talked to have as I had to have the answers. So I think for the first year to try to make my people feel safe, I was charging too hard with the answer. And at a certain point, I had some great young leaders that work with me that slowed me down and some seasoned leaders that, that work on my team. And what I needed to do was stop and listen. So I remember one day I had this meeting and somebody shared feedback with me. And I said, I appreciate what you're saying. I don't think you're right. We've got to, you know, we've got to keep charging. We've got to keep going. And after that, I had a coaching call and heard another leader say it to me. Sometimes you can't hear it in yourself, but I heard it in her. Um, so I called the leader back and said, you know what? I asked people to share. So I listen and I'm not hearing you. So I think during the pandemic, for me, that was like a stop moment. Um, and I realized you're charging to the point where you're not hearing the people that care and are supporting you because you want to protect them. But in the doing so, you're actually creating separation. So for me, I needed to stop and listen. And, you know, I've got this you know, incredible, you know, 23, 24 year old on my team who created some perspective that we were ultimately running in the wrong direction on, you know, re kind of recreating coaching because it has changed significantly during the pandemic. Um, but sometimes the answers are there, but if you're trying to give them, you can't hear them. Yeah. And I think also um, lots of us felt as leaders, we needed to, we needed to be strong. I was like, there was a calling for we were in the trenches and we maybe were that for in the beginning, the first wave, but actually what we needed to do afterwards and including myself, we actually needed to stop and, let other people get involved because now the shock was over we needed to build back and we and i think it's you get busy doing and you you think the leadership becomes doing again and i think lots of leaders are very busy you talk about it in your book as well you see their calendar and i was just laughing i, I asked somebody i've asked so many people over the last year show me your calendar and they see all these meetings and said so how, why do you need to be in these meetings and it's again we're just getting busy and obsessed with business i don't know if you see the same especially in hospitality is like value to be busy and work hard 
And you talked about, uh, you know, Phil Jackson and, and one of the coaches that I really modeled, Phil Jackson did as well, was Coach John Wooden. Um, so the winningest coach in NCAA history, it was really about process and foundation. But one of the coaches, that, the, the quotes that Coach John Wooden had is, don't mistake activity for achievement. It hangs in every one of our offices. So we have sister offices through the other company. Um, but it's one that there's this addiction to being busy. So, and I'll say that in the book, but in, early in my career, one of my goals was 70 hour work weeks were uh, a badge of pride. I, you know, it gave me value. If I worked lots of hours, I, I gave value. But one thing I'm really working with leaders on is the difference between value versus time. So I no longer sell time. Um, the leaders I work with don't exchange hours for, for development, growth, support, ops. It's really, how do I have value? How do I have impact? How do I be present? Um, and a lot of us, we can all work 80 hour work weeks, but there's a point of diminishing return. And I learned that one really the hard way. Like I stretched relationships. I've had strain in my family. You know, I've had separation in my marriage um, based in an early stage of, of running the wrong direction. Um, but I think watching, uh, Tony Robbins says success leaves clues. Um, and that shook me. So I started to look at leaders I want to mirror, um, leaders I want to be, um, and that I respect and started to look at what they did. And I found they took time in the morning to work out. They had a positive routine. They could make their kids game. Um, and I made that commitment as I started to have kids to, to, to be there and be present. So my focus now is, you know, we, we, there's more work to do than you could ever get done. How do we focus on what truly matters? You know, at least a few hours a day, support our people the rest of the day, but just stay focused on where we're going, not on what we're doing. And uh, it's so interesting. I, I um, one a guy, uh, David Hyatt, he's called, he has a company called Hyatt Jeans and the Do Lectures. And he talks about being busy is being lazy because it's so easy to clutter your time up, but it's so hard. It's such a uh, skill and habit to learn to declutter and saying no. And as every week go through with a fine tooth came every half an hour you spend your time in the week. Is this really going to move? Is this the one thing that really is going to move the business forward? Uh, I'm doing this week or I, I'm creating progress. So I'm just being busy. Yeah. And that's one thing like we're, we're really big on, you know, for, for, for self is just, you know, getting, allowing leaders to be clear. And I, I had a chance to spend some time with Jack Welsh, the former CEO of General Electric. Um, and Jack Welsh, they share the story that they called him Neutron Jack, that he would fire all these people and he blew up all these companies. And he was a little bit older. He's passed rec recently, the last couple of years, but he's a little bit older. And he, and he stood up and he said, you know what? You know, somebody asked him, what's it like being called Neutron Jack? And he said, you know what? That's really not fair. He said, the one thing in my company is everybody knew what was expected of them and everybody knew exactly where they stood. And I think our opportunity as leaders is where do we need to invest our time to have the best result for ourselves as leaders? And then how do we create the clarity for our people with all of the noise? And in the book, we talk about an eight to 13 concept. If any leader out there can, can get clear and invest with intention eight to 13 hours a week, you can fundamentally change your business inside of six months. I don't need 60. You don't have 60 because you got to do ops. You got to serve your people. You got to serve your guests. But if we can get consistent in blocking eight to 13 hours a week, not a day a week, and break the time out and put it into intentional tasks that set your team up for success this quarter this year and going ahead for the next 36 months, doing that, that process consistently, we can fundamentally see change. You know, we can change our bodies inside of 90 days. People were wondering, like recently through the pandemic, I lost 40 pounds in 90 days. And it was people like, oh, you're, you, you must have done a crash diet. It's just consistency in the direction of our goals. 45 minutes a day allowed to create the result and a little bit more responsible eating. Um, but how do we create that, that simple focus consistently and allow people to put it in their calendar first? Where that looks like for you, is it mornings, is it nights? I, I don't want it to be at midnight if it doesn't have to be, but how does it fit for you? Yeah, and I think it's uh, the power of compounding uh, is and doing one percent every day. People totally underestimate, and then the, the, the and that's the principle of habits. When you start doing things or investing time in things, you want to be a better writer, write every day. If you want to be a better runner, run every day. You don't have to run for an hour; you can run for twenty minutes. It's, it's about 
getting out feet and getting in as a rhythm in your body uh, and, and there's science behind this uh, and i think a, a lot of people different people atomic habits uh talking about tony robbins talks about it, and it's the foundation but you need to find as i think and i want to hear your view on this because what i've learned you need to find your recipe or uh, your your algorithm and it's yours and sometimes it changes over time as things happen in your life and you need to have new habits yeah, that's true. So I, I've got a, my change was I've got a beautiful 11 month old boy at home. So my routine had to change. So that was part of the forcing function for me was to see how do I want to show up and how do I want to show up for my team, for my family, for myself and where that started, what I found in my algorithm or my routine is I needed to carve out time daily for myself. I remember th three different therapists laughed at me before I got it. Not, they didn't know each other in different sessions to say, Matt, with all your work you do, where's the time for you? And I went to give a response and they all laughed. So I thought, okay, there's got to be something here. So my day starts now at 4.30 in the morning. So I get up at 4.30 I, and people are saying 4.30. It doesn't work for most people, but I go to bed at night because um, I go to bed, we set my kids up and we've got a whole routine there. But the 4.30 wake up allows me to get up, journal, um, do some of our social content, work out, and then be there for my kids when they wake up. And I've never been a morning person. Um, and that's been a routine for the last few years. But again, I looked at people um, and it seemed unrealistic, but I'm actually more energetic, more prepared. And it's, it's a must do, not a should do for me. So this morning, was a, my, my kids were traveling uh, this weekend. So I got a chance to get up a little bit earlier than usual, got the workout done, still got an hour in with my daughter this morning, which I'm most good, lit, lit up my day. And now I can show up present for for my work, for, for our call here today. But the re I agree, your routine is yours, whatever it looks like. Um, the big change for me was, and it was forced, it wasn't easy, it took years, was to make sure to carve out time for myself. And the, my journaling process and my, you know, my little work Peloton workout is, is a big impact on, on myself personally. Uh, and another thing you said that is, is interesting that you're carving out that, that time for, for yourself because actually it's it, you are getting yourself together before the day starts, whatever that is, if it's exercise or journaling or reading or whatever that makes it, it makes it happen. It, it, it gives, you know, so much power and energy for the rest of the day because then you've done the most important bit. And I think a lot of people, you know, because doing something for yourself, without being egoistic is more important than doing things for others. Because if you're not doing that thing for yourself, if you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of others. And that's the, you mentioned James Clear book, Atomic Habits. And, and the one thing the reading, I read five pages a morning. You know, and by the time I have a coffee, it's five pages. Maybe sometimes it's 10 or 12, but it's a commitment to self. The contract I've signed with myself is five pages. I, I love to learn, but I'm more audio book. But I also do know as I'm looking at we're, we're writing a second book and doing other things that actually reading creates a whole different creative process for me. So, but those small compound impacts of what do we need to do consistently? And I think it's out of agreement with myself before it, um, James Clear also talks about changing your identity. The big shift I've seen in the restaurant leaders I've worked with that have seen the most change. It wasn't about the change. It's that they actually changed who, their identity and who they were. The group I was with yesterday, their, their tagline, they have 14 pubs here um, across Canada, very big, high volume locations. And they wanted to be their neighbor's first choice. Beautiful tagline, beautiful locations, neighborhood pubs. But yesterday they said, we want to be best in our category. And that's their identity. Uh, and lunch showed up at this great workshop and they said, hey, we have the best pizza in Toronto. And seven other people immediately shouted out, yes, we do. We absolutely have the best pizza. That's an identity change. Right? So they, they've actually changed, they program for themselves. So for me, I had to change my identity because I could be healthy for a period of time. I could wake up early for a period of time, but it wasn't who I was. So I would go back to my old modeled behaviors. Um, and now what I'm looking at for restaurant leaders I support um, and working with myself, what's, my, what's the belief in my identity? And that's where my change happens. And then the behavior just happens to follow. The routine, the algorithm is what follows my, and that, that from James Clear, the book Atomic Habits, that, that shook me. That was a, a big breakthrough for me last year. Um, and I think also it's also, also that lots of people hear about people when they've done these transformation and it talks about their, the routines, morning and evening routines, but actually it's okay to fail. Right? That's part of the process of calibrating because I say that to people, you're not going to get it right. It took me, you know, I, I still tweak mine and, and some days I can only get three pieces out of my routine in the morning because I have small kids as well. 
But then I know I will always get these three, and these are the foundations of my practice. So it's, it's reading, doing some stretching, and uh, journaling. If I get those three, I'm ready for the day, no matter what. I can go through the day, but then I can supercharge it with three other things. But if I did, don't get done. That's okay. I think like you're sharing there too, it's so powerful for people to hear is be kind to yourself. Like my, I, the way that I talk to myself in my head for the last 40 years, especially like the learning disability tag. And I've got this, I am stupid in my head messaging that's been going on for years, but I'm just so, so aggressive to myself and just being kind to yourself. Like I'll share that client that I had, it was with yesterday. said they had the best pizza. I got home and my, there's a bunch of pizza at my house. I ate a whole pizza last night, but I didn't beat myself up for it. And I sat down and before I would have shamed myself and now I got to work out for an hour and a half the next day. And I said, no, it was a, it's been a great week. The pizza was pretty darn good. I don't know if it's the best in Toronto, but it was pretty darn good. Um, and, um, and, I, and I ate the whole pizza and I walked away with it saying, hey, I'm going to be kind to myself. That's my treat. I've got some other sh- stuff to do on the weekend to, to maintain on my healthy track. But that's a shift in my identity too. Like perfect's not achievable for me. Um, I don't know if it is for anybody out there listening, but I know it's not achievable for me. But how do we look at progress in the direction of our goals? And that's that's all I'm striving for. Is you look at that Kobe, you shared the one percent better, the Mamba mentality. If I, I wrap that around Kobe Bryant, it's how do we how do we just look to be better every single day? And uh, session yesterday was great, and so was the pizza. Yeah, uh, uh, it made me think. It actually came me. We are taking a bit of a different direction because it's so interesting when you talk about leaders. And there's something I've been struggling with myself to be totally transparent. Is that thing you are. You can almost go into that elite soldier mode uh, where you forget play. And play is such an important part of being. And I think I forgot that in the pandemic. I was told by my wife. So she said, like, you, you, Michael, we need, need to be fun as well. You can't just be saving stuff. Um, and, and I didn't hear it the first time, of course. But I, she knocked on a couple of times because she's very kind. Um, and my mentor said it as well. He said that, that there's not, you don't have much fun plan now, do you? That's not like you. And and I think we forget that. I don't know if you see that in many CEOs and so on. It's, it's about that, you know, identity as a leader, not as a whole person. Yeah. And that's you know, the, the one thing that I you know, got a chance. And, and my, my coach said the same thing, especially when I was about to have my daughter. She's six now. And he, and he said, Matt, you're so rigid. You're not fun. And he said, and he, and he, he always looked for leverage. And his leverage was, hey, you're going to be fun for your daughter. Like you're there for everybody else and you're always doing stuff and, and you're busy, but do you, do you just be playful? Like he got me to do uh, improv classes type stuff. Can you can you just be playful? Absolute nightmare for me, but but I did it. Absolute absolute nightmare. <laughs> but, but it was fun when I when I got through it. But one thing that I see with leaders, because I'm out with these leaders, and where I'll give them a hard time, because they'll often say, "Let's have a one on one session with the CEO or a senior leader," and they're like, "Hey, let's go for one of my locations for dinner, and you know we're gonna get all this food." And I'm like, "When's the last time you've done this with your team?" Well, I haven't done it in six months. But I'm like, hey, I'm like, I, I, I'm very grateful for it. Um, but one thing I ask for them is anytime we do those dinners again, there's always members of the team joining us. Like, how do we create a time just to gear down? I'll, I'll force some leaders that I know that are very redlined into environments. I'll actually schedule retreats in, in spaces where we need to play. So there's a, a, and this isn't always, but this is for one-on-one coaching with senior leaders, but I'll find a way for them to get into their body. It could be something simple. People like to bike, people like to golf, people like to do whichever um, we've actually done some pretty fun stuff with some some different teams. But um, the one side is I just want people to be a little bit more human at work. So I talk about human to human connection a lot. And when I meet, no matter who the senior leader is, if it's a GM with their team, if it's a regional manager, SLT member, or a C-level position, when I interview your people, what they want most is time that's not wrapped around ops with you. The biggest thing I hear about is the person just wants the coffee, just wants to have the beer. Um, just wants to, to look and have a conversation, just as you shared in, in our pre-call, you know, how, how did you get here? Why did you start this? You know, how, why did you fight through the pandemic? You know, tell me about your dog, you know, stuff like that. We just create a little bit of space and time to connect in a human to human way. Um, and it's hard, but my job as a coach is to create awareness when it's being done really well, celebrate it. But if it's a gap, it's just to highlight again, what's the benefit if you do and risk if you don't. And the good thing is the people get value, but who gets the most value? Because leadership is lonely. A lot of leaders out there, especially listening to this, they're out there and they're lonely because they've had to fight for two years of crashing waves. 
and they've had to do a bit of it. On, they're not doing it alone, but they've had to ha- fight a little bit harder. What if I can put a senior leader in a position to create some space to, to have connection, they get as much value as the team does. And one of the things I was thinking about, I was reading about the book, you also talk about the getting the, the people factor right. And when you've seen leaders, you know, get their people factor right, what kind of results is happening? You know, because we always have these anecdotal things uh, from, you know, great organizations and the sales exploded and profit went up. But what, what really is happening inside the organization? What kind of dynamics are you seeing? What are, how are people behaving? What is happening? Yeah, I think and that's a perfect framing there because the the profitability of sales is the result. But what I see most is what the the usual, the first step is, is the office becomes lighter and then it starts to become enjoyable again. And then it starts to become fun. Um, I've had a chance to get exposure to a lot of incredible restaurant groups with incredible growth, um, delivering to shareholders or to owners or bonuses are being hit, but everybody's miserable. Um, so results don't always equal culture or happiness. So the big thing that I've seen is people invest in themselves and in their people and in, into ultimately what culture is a big word, but what goes into their culture is we see that the the office is light again. And I was in a session two days ago with a team that was really rigid through the pandemic, but I just stood back and watched them as they laughed and joked and had some conversation and some space. And I'm an emotional person. I'm kind of cheesy. I'll get goosebumps at times or tears. I said, I really want success for this team, but they've worked so hard to make it through their 150 locations in QSR pizza space. But I've watched them as I step back from the meeting and it was just fun and light again. And the, the whole shift and watching the people be fun and light, but I looked at the owner who's a dear friend of mine now and, and could see the, just the weight, right? The body language is different. Shoulders are down. You know, there's some hands we were making, they were asking for some big requests for their upcoming annual conference and, we had, we had some good laughs, but um, we have to realize that work is supposed to deliver us an experience and hopefully an outcome that allows us to do things in our life. And a lot of the leaders that I've met is they've said that the really successful financial people that I get to meet on my travel speaking or, or in different conferences, and they've said, make sure and don't miss this time, right? Don't always build the goose egg or the time or the money or the result because you have a chance to miss sometimes what's right in front of you, which is the today. And what I've realized through my coaching is I have today. Um, I've had a lot of loss in my life. I've lost both my parents and I can see how quickly things can go away, but I can enjoy the crap out of today and uh, be present. So that's, that's my goal. And that's what I'm seeing in most successful leaders is they get that benefit first. And once it's easy and fun, results will follow. Shifting the, the conversation a bit over to talking about how do you see the, what is your prediction for hospitality? The new era, many calls of hospitality, is very, it's still very difficult times for, for many operators. But what, what is your view from? Um, in my view, some people might not like the response and, and know that it's coming from a really genuine place. But my belief is we'll continue to see some contraction before we see the rebuild. So there will be, as we've looked through the financial crisis, as we've looked at a lot of areas through non-smoking, um, you know, there are, there's nothing like the pandemic, but there are patterns. So often what I find in major cities globally is there's more restaurants and seats than there are guests and certain major cities get to this point where although they're running successful operations, there's almost too much choice. So I think what the pandemic's going to do, and I don't want to see anybody lose or anybody hurt, but we will see some contraction. And then obviously we'll see this healthy rebound. And if we look at the financial crisis in a lot of major cities, we saw these scrappy new uh, entrepreneurial restaurant groups start to grow and expand. You know, they had two locations. Now they have 12 um, going back to the financial crisis or 20. So we're getting this new injection of excitement and brand. And then hopefully for people that have well-established brands, the pandemic was the, you know, was the punch in the chest or I fortunately say it's in the throat to, to make us gasp a little bit. Is who, who do we want to become and where do we want to be in 36 months? Because one thing I know is what led to your success pre-pandemic will not lead to the same success post-pandemic. It, it just will not. If you mirror your best year, you know, 2017 was your best financial year, growth year, retention year, you do that exact model pattern in 2022 or 2023, it's not going to produce the same result. So I think there'll be contraction and I hope there'll be evolution. And I do think there'll still continue to be, as we're, we're seeing in most major markets, consolidation. There's some really well-funded groups out there that are that are right now eating up real estate and hopefully how in a healthy way acquiring groups. So um, 
that that's what I see. I know there's a lot in there. I don't know if if you agree, but it's not the the favorite response to to a lot of people. But I think um, that's what I've seen so far. No, I think even if people don't say it, they know it. It's not over. There's a, there's a, there's a last wave or a, a big shock, and we also the, the, how the world is moving right now. And I know, especially in your parts, you there, there's talk about you know maybe a recession in the economy in the, in the U.S. Uh, there's inflation rate, and all that will trickle into hospitality. Another crisis we need to deal with. Um, and and it, it was probably waiting even before the pandemic and the pandemic in a way and the, the amount of money that was printed now we're going into economics has probably kept us in a way uh, so i think you're right and that's also a, a, a thing around are you a relevant brand in the new era are you a relevant brand not for customers and employees it's very important it's both sides and that's one thing for us that we looked at it at our, you know, couple of relatively small business companies, right? What I, what the conversation with our team during the pandemic is if we don't evolve, we don't exist. Uh, one of the groups I'm involved in is entrepreneurs organization, but the larger chapter of entrepreneurs organization globally is young presidents organization. And they had their global conference prior to the pandemic. And the whole theme of the conference was that 50% of industry in their rooms, the most successful operators globally are going to disappear in the next five to seven years. If you look at something like transportation, you imagine being, or logistics right now, looking at self-serviced warehouses and, you know, we have auto driving trucks. That, that's not a future thing. That's a now thing. So like our industry will evolve and change. So we had to look at three years out as what, what are the wants and needs from coaching? And we had to drop some stuff that was highly profitable that we really liked, but didn't, wasn't part of our future. In your restaurant, Brent, is are you relevant? You know, how, what is your, why does your community need you to exist? You know, there's, there's more seats than there are guests. So why does your community, whether you're an independent operator or a large quick service multi-site or a hotel, if we can get clear on that question, not in a negative way, it's a very positive and playful question. You might say, why do you exist? And why do we exist? And, and what are we looking to, to prove? And how do we, how do we claim our space? Um, and one thing, not to go back to Tony Robbins again, but he says, find the underserviced niche, niche in the market and fill it. Not find the masses. And that's, I think, what a lot of our brands are, are doing right now is, um, you know, even the large client in the pizza space, they're going to own the pre premium category. They're going to own service quality in the premium category, very niche premium category, category, very high price because the price game's over. And it's tough in pizza, especially. So, and just as an example, is what space can you own? Independent or multi-site or or global group, um, own your space and with the with the intention to own the space. I know it's easier said than done. Yeah, and then your whole business has to follow that. You know, is 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 proposition or positioning in your market. Mark product market fit it's in, and then your whole experience has to follow that. You can't just have a great product, but you also need to deliver the other things. So they're all in harmony. And I think that's where sometimes we have to go away from the being so product focused and more on the the total experience if it's online, offline, and so on. And you can see the really good operators get that. Um, so so. Um, you you've been reading a lot of books, Matt, as well, and you read every day. Like if you should give, like you know, let's keep it at three books. You said that any leaders should read right now because they will they will help them. Um, it's going to be hard. My my, I could see all the pieces fluttering through, and I'm trying to think of the audience. Um, one one that I would go back to, and there's two from this author, and and they kind of mirror each other, but. Um, there's some of the books I see behind you are some of my favorites, but I would go back to Patrick Lachoni's work, um, on five dysfunctions of a team, or there's a book called the advantage. So Patrick writes fables and the, the advantage was the first book that wasn't a fable. And I can literally work through that book with a group for 18 months and you could repeat the cycle again. And I've had a chance to have exposure to, to you know, hundreds of coaches and just say if there's a, an amazing 24, as I really look at our work together or their work, a lot of it is grounded in the foundation, whether they know it or not, or it's tagged or not in Patrick's work. So I would look at that. Um, one of the books that, that I love, I know there's a little bit of a date on it, just in the time period we're going through, but Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill is a book that I read every year. Um, and it's not about rich and money, but it's just that the, I'm a big believer in law of attraction. Um, I think Michael, me and you have a lot more alignment, you know, just know each other across the pond right now. But I think things like this happen for a reason. And, and the, th the book Think and Grow Rich changed my life. Um, 
it was the first book I read. I didn't finish a book till I was 25. And it's one that I pick up every year. But I really do believe that we we dream and we think up our reality before it actually, and then we share it before it becomes a reality. Um, and then one of my favorite books that I've read over the last couple of years is, I'm a big fan of Jim Calls, All His Work. Um, I'm, again, I'm not reading. It can be hard for me. Um, so good to great. It was, it was a very tough read for me. But the Beyond Entrepreneurship 2.0, if you are a senior leader in a com- the yellow book that's behind Michael, is a remarkable, remarkable book that I, I just felt so excited reading it. And it was a lighter read for me than Jim Collins' other stuff, just for me personally. I love all of his work, but um, I just found that I flipped through the pages, went back through, found any time. He doesn't speak much anymore in a public forum. Um, but anything I can get access to, to him is is a must do. And, and I just absolutely love that book. And there's there's dozens more, but that would be a, a very tough top three. And uh, if you just read one chapter in there, it's the uh, first who uh, and then uh, first who and what. And he says, you know, you can't have a great vision without great people. And uh, I think that's very from connecting to our conversation today and also what leaders sometimes forget. They think that the vision solve everything or the purpose, but you need to put some great people. That's your job to set, set the right team. And, and we look at that, right? Just not to go, I know we're up on time, but the, he wrote that book 25 years ago, right? So 25th anniversary, two years ago. So we might be thinking like people might be the new buzz thing coming, buzzword because of the great resignation, but you look at the great books and the great leaders and the great companies. This isn't new. This is just COVID didn't bring up new problems. It just magnified pre-existing problems or opportunities. And uh, people has always been at the forefront and always been you know, the, the over the product, the secret sauce for so many companies. Yeah, and it's so interesting. You know, there's so many new books coming out all the time. But you know, if you go back to Good to Great or Jim Collins' work there, if you look at that, the foundation of these great companies never changed because they found the that they were on the pursuit in the early years to find the algorithm of what made them great, and then they just kept refining it, and they didn't change all the time. Companies that change all the time will fail. When they when they when they and the McDonald's is a great example. I spent most of my career in McDonald's. It's a, it's the foundation is still the same. QSR and uh, quality of service and cleanliness. And uh, and it's the people that drive that and they understand that people and the training that goes into that. But that, that's, that's a different story. So here in, I have a couple more questions for you, Matt, uh, on, on, uh, before we finish up. Um, what would uh, you leave leaders with, like your top three advice, or maybe there's only one advice to keep it simple, for them to accelerate their business in, in a, a very uncertain time uh, ahead? I think the the one thing, and this is where we, we started lightly in the conversation, is everything happens with intention and clarity. So what I want for, for you and yourself is, one thing we ask leaders is, how do you win this year? So whether it be the calendar year or their fiscal year. So what does winning look like? Right now in North America, we have uh, Stanley Cup playoffs, we have the NBA playoffs, um, and those teams that are in the playoffs know exactly the definition of success. But often when I ask an operator, what does success mean? They'll say sales, profitability, costs, uh, store growth, new locations. But really those are results of behavior. But what do we really need to do? So you can stop because as a leader, by the time you get to the end of your calendar, your fiscal year, you're on to your next set of goals. But what I want for people is to have clarity of what success looks like so they can stop and celebrate along the way but also recognize their people. Our industry has spent decades focusing on the service we did wrong, you know, the store location that didn't work so well, the manager we thought was our next future leader that turned over. But I know if we want to see change and we want to see quicker accelerated results, as is proven in all the habits books, not just James Clear's, we need to focus on the positive recognition in the direction of our goals. So clarity, everything happens with intention. What's the exact result? And if you want to do the exercise, whenever you listen to this, I encourage you to get a napkin and a pen and draw a visual. It, it triggers different um, areas of our brain in the creative process. Sometimes we want to have the answer. It's not about getting it right. It's about being playful and curious around this question. Get clear on how you win. Find a safe and fun way to communicate it. Repeat yourself relentlessly and your team will follow your lead. Great, great, um, Matt. So if... Um... There was one question you wished I've asked you. What would that be, and what would you have answered? 
I think, you know, since you share that, it just popped in. So I try not to filter things when they do, but what's in the way for people not investing in their people? So I, I think what I say, like, so I think we say, but why should we, but why don't we? Um, and it's funny, I'm asking myself the question because there's not a, there's not a set answer to it. But one thing I want to dig in is everybody knows there's the opportunity to invest in your people and why we should invest in our people. But often there's the side of budget. Um, what if they don't like it? What if I don't do it right? You know, can we really afford the time? We should be doing ops. Like we should be doing, we've, we've got to be in the restaurant right now. But for a lot of people out there, if they hear the side of investing in people or themselves, sometimes it's not about to start the conversation. What should we do? Because we know that it's where's the resistance and what's in the way. And my job and myself, what I've been coached on and taught is where I feel resistance, there's usually something there. And it doesn't mean you need to go put a big budget, you know, content's free. Post pandemic content's free. You can go on YouTube and find the best education on the planet for free. So you don't need to go hire, you don't have to hire a coach or support. You can. Um, content's free. But first, for you, if you're not doing it, I encourage you to spend some time over, you know, again, over a coffee or, you know, a little bit of space with yourself. What, wh why are you not? And that objection is usually will free you should you want to take a step forward. But um, you probably won't make the investment unless you figure out what's in the way. Mm -hmm. That's a super, super, super interesting. It also fits really well with your advice as well, because if you don't find out what's in the way, the bottleneck you talked about earlier, then then you're not really going to have the progress. Where can uh, people find out more about you, Matt, and uh, the book and, and all the stuff you're involved in? Yeah, the, the one, so our website is mattrolf.com. So Matt and Rolf is R-O-L-F-E. You can go there. It'll outline all of um, you know the book. It'll outline our coaching, our speaking. We have lots of free downloadable assets, the topics that we've talked about here. So one of our one of our goals is to to give away a lot of our content, to give away our tools. If we can help, if people can help themselves and we can put it in people's hands, we want to do that. If we can support you, we will. Um, but there's a lot of free content there. If you go on LinkedIn and follow me at, Matt Rolf on LinkedIn. Um, we put out a video of content a day. Um, they're usually minute clips. They're from my experience of working with these incredible, you know, top ten percent of the industry global, globally in all my travels. But we're we're putting out a lot of content in hopes to to help. And the book, you can't do it alone, is available on Amazon. Um, so you'll be able to find it anywhere on Amazon. It's the quickest route to get it to you now. And We've been overwhelmed by the response. Uh, it really was more for the industry and our clients. But uh, if you get a chance to pick it up. Uh, and we will be launching an audio book very soon. Um, fun way, Michael, share this for the first time. I haven't shared it. We'll be launching an audio book soon. The audio book version will be released and it'll be free. Um, so we're just looking at the vehicle to deliver it to people. We want to help. And if we can get it in more managers' hands. Uh, and I agree with Michael just said something very important there. We designed the book and a lot of books now. So you don't have to read the whole thing. I look, read the chapter list, find a chapter that's important to you. That's the topic right now. You can focus on a 12-minute chapter, create a great conversation with your team. Yeah, because that's the power of books or audio books uh, is that you can just start the conversation out there and you're learning and you're improving. Um, and audio is very powerful in uh, in the hospitality industry because a lot of people didn't join it to read books or do online learning. They can do it on the go. It's on their phone. So I think that's a really, really great gift to, to the industry. So, so thank you for that, Matt. And thank you for coming on the program and sharing your insights and wisdom around leadership and the industry. Yeah, such an awesome conversation. So grateful to be um, here and, and be with you. And I know how much work it is. So I just want to say thank you to you. There's people that are leading from the front of our industry during the pandemic. I don't know if people out there know how hard it is to, pro, to do a podcast like this and get the audience and the reach and all that goes behind it. Um, but there's certain people globally that have continued to lead from the front and you're one of them. And I'm grateful to be here. And thank you for all you've done through the pandemic and prior to the pandemic. Thank you, Matt. Thank you so much. Take good care uh, and power and energy to, to you and the team. Thank you. Matt, thank you so much for your great leadership hacks, especially why clarity is the ultimate leadership tool to boost engagement. You should now reflect on how can I create strong clarity for myself and my people. To get further inspiration on how to ensure better clarity, tune in to episode 95 with Ali Gordon, coach and mentor on your belief system. And if you enjoyed today's conversation, please share, rate, review, or subscribe to one of our channels, which all can be done via the website hospitalitymavericks.com. 
A big thank you to Biz Simply for supporting us, bringing great insights, strategies, and tools to help the industry thrive, not just survive. Check them out at bizsimply.com or via their socials at bizsimply or bizsimplyhq. You can also email them directly at advice at bizsimply.com. A big thank you to Fina Charlton, who's the show producer and editor from the Podcast Collective. Tune in next time for another interview. And in the meantime, find out more about us and subscribe to the newsletter for more Maverick insights at hospitalitymavericks.com. And don't worry, if you didn't get all of this, there will be links in the show notes. I'm Michael Tinkser, and you've been listening to the Hospitality Maverick podcast show. Be Maverick.